have loved England dearly and deeply since that first morning, shining and pure, the white cliffs of Dover I saw rising steeply out of the sea that once made her secure. I had no thought then of husband or lover. I was a traveler, the guest of a week. Yet when they pointed the white cliffs of Dover, startled I found there were tears on my cheeks. I have loved England and still as a stranger. Here is my home, but I still am alone. Now in her hour of trial and danger, only the English are really her own. Nineteen fourteen, early May, London was crowded and rich and gay. A light blue carpet on the stair and tall young footmen everywhere, tall young men with English faces standing rigidly in their places. I went up the stairs between them all, strange and frightened and shy and small, and as I entered the ballroom door, saw something I never had seen before except in portraits. A stout old guest with a broad blue ribbon across his breast. That blue as deep as the southern sea, bluer than skies can ever be. The Countess of Salisbury, Edward III, no damn merit, the Duke, I heard my own voice saying, upon my word, the garter, and clapped my hands like a child. Someone beside me turned and smiled and, looking down at me, said, I fancy you're Bertie's Australian cousin Nancy. He told me to tell you that he'd be late at the foreign office and not to wait supper for him, but to go with me and try and behave as if I were he. I should have told him on the spot that I had no cousin, that I was not Australian Nancy, that my name was Susan Dunn and that I came from a small white town on a deep-cut bay in the smallest state in the U.S.A. I meant to tell him, but changed my mind. I needed a friend, and he seemed kind. So I put my gloved hand into his glove, and we danced together and fell in love. Young and in love, how magical the phrase, how magical the fact. Who has not yearned over young lovers when to their amaze they fall in love and find their love returned? We went to the tower, we went to the zoo, we saw every flower in the gardens at Kew. We saw King Charles a prancing on his long-tailed horse and thought him more entrancing than better kings, of course. At a strange early hour in St. James's Palace Yard, we watched in a shower the changing of the guard. And I said, what a pity to have just a week to spend when London is a city whose beauties never end. John had one of those English faces that always were and always will be found in the cream of English places till England herself sink into the sea. A blonde, bold face with prominent eyes, a little bit bluer than English skies. And what a voice he had, gentle, profound, clear, masculine. I melted at the sound. And still I did not see my life was changed, utterly different. By this love estranged for ever and ever from my native land, that I was now of that unhappy band who lose the old and cannot gain the new, however loving and however true to their new duties, I could never be an Englishwoman. There was that in me, Puritan, stubborn, that would not agree to English standards, though I did not see the truth because I thought them good or ill, so great a people, and I think so still. The English are frosty when you're no kiss or kin of theirs, but how they alter when once they take you in. The kindest, the truest, the best friends ever known. It's hard to remember how they froze you to the bone. They showed me all London, Johnny and his friends. They took me to the country for long weekends. I never was so happy. I never had such fun. I stayed many weeks in England instead of just one. But a day came when I was forced to face facts. I went down to see the family place. John's mother, and the cradle of his race. A red brick manor house in Devon, in a beechwood of old grey trees, ivy climbing to the clustered chimneys, rustling in the wet south breeze, gardens trampled down by Cromwell's army, orchards of apple trees and pears, casements that had looked for the armada, 
and a ghost on the stairs. Johnny's mother, the Lady Jean, child of a penniless Scottish peer, was warm, handsome, high-colored, lean, with eyes like Johnny's, more blue and clear, like bubbles of glass in her fine, tanned face. And presently she said, as they sooner or later always say, You're an American, Miss Dan. Really, you do not speak like one. She seemed to think she'd said a thing both courteous and flattering. I answered, though my wrists were weak with anger. Not at all, I speak. At least I've always thought this true as educated people do in any country, even mine. Really? I saw her head incline. I saw her ready to assert Americans are easily hurt. I saw the house with its oaken stair and the Tudor rose on the Newell post, the panelled upper gallery where they told me you heard the family ghost. A gentle, unhappy ghost who sighs outside one's door on the night one dies. I saw the picture of every son, Percy the eldest and John and Bill in Chinese customs, and the youngest one, Peter the sailor at Osborne Phil, and the daughter, Enid, married a lass to a civil servant in farm address. A little thing happened just before we left. The evening papers came. John, flicking them over to find a score, spoke for the first time a certain name. The name of a town in a distant land, etched on our hearts by a murderer's hand. Mother and son exchanged a glance, a curious glance of strength and dread. I thought, what matter to them if Franz Ferdinand dies? One of them said, this might be serious. Yes, you're right. The other answered, it really might. The English love their country with a love steady and simple, wordless, dignified. I think it sets their patriotism above all others. We Americans have pride. We glory in our country's short romance. We boast of it and love it. But Englishmen will serve day after day, obey the law, and do dull tasks that keep a nation strong. Once I remember in London how I saw pale, shabby people standing in a long line in the twilight and the misty rain to pay their tax. I then saw England plain. Johnny and I were married. England then had been a week at war, and all the men wore uniform as English people can, unconscious of it. Percy, the best man, as thin as paper and as smart as paint, bade us goodbye with admirable restraint went from the church to catch his train to hell and died, saving his batman from a shell. We went down to Devon in a warm summer rain, knowing that our happiness might never come again. I, not forgetting till death us do part, was outrageously happy with death in my heart. Lovers in peacetime, with fifty years to live, have time to tease and quarrel and question what to give. But lovers in wartime better understand the fullness of living with death close at hand. My father wrote me a letter, my father scholarly, indolent, strong, teaching Greek better than high school students repay, teaching Greek in the winter, but all summer long, sailing a yawl in Narragansett Bay. So, Susan, my dear, the letter began, you've fallen in love with an Englishman. Well, they're a manly, attractive lot, if you happen to like them, which I do not. I'm a Yankee through and through, and I don't like them or the things they do. Whenever it's come to a knockdown fight with us, they were wrong and we right. If you don't believe me, cast your mind back over history, and what do you find? They certainly had no justification for that maddening plan to impose taxation without any form of representation. Your man may be all that a man should be, only don't bring him back to me saying he can't get decent tea. He could have got his tea all right in Boston Harbor a certain night when your great-great-grandmother, also a Sioux, shook enough tea from her husband's shoe to supply her house for a week or two. The War of 1812 seems to me about as just as a war could be. How could we help but come to grips with a nation that stopped and searched our ships and took off our seamen for no other reason except that they needed crews that season? I can get angry still at the tale of their letting the Alabama sail and Palmerston being insolent to Lincoln and Seward over the Trent. All very long ago, you'll say, but whenever I go up Boston Way, I drive through Concord, that neck of the wood where once the embattled farmers stood, 
And I think of Revere and the old South people, and I say, by heck, we're the only people who lick them, not only once, but twice. Never forget it. That's my advice. They have their points. They're honest and brave, loyal and sure, sure as the grave. They make other nations seem pale and flighty, but they do think England is God Almighty. And you must remind them now and then that other countries breed other men, from all of which you will think me rather unjust. I am your devoted father. I read and saw my home with a sudden yearning, the small white wooden house, the grass green door, my father's study with the fire burning and books piled on the floor. I saw the dear Curie, two black kittens, stalking relentlessly an empty spool. I saw a little girl in scarlet mittens trudging through snow to school. I settled down in Devon when Johnny went to France. Such a tame ending to a great romance. Two lonely women with nothing much to do but to get to know each other. She did, and I did too. Mornings at the rectory learning how to roll bandages and always saving light and coal. Oh, that house was bitter as winter closed in. In spite of heavy stockings and woolen necks the skin, I was cold and wretched. And never unaware of John more cold and wretched in a trench out there. All that long winter I wanted so much to complain. But my mother-in-law, as far as I could see, felt no such impulse, though she was always in pain. And as the winter fogs grew thick, took to walking with a stick heavily. And not for the blinking of an eye did she ever stop thinking of the suffering of Englishmen and her two sons in the trenches. Now and then I could forget for an instant in a book or a letter, but she never, never forgot either one, Percy or John though I knew she loved one better, Percy the wastrel, the gambler, the eldest son. I think I shall always remember until I die her face that day in December, when in a hospital ward together she and I were writing letters for wounded men and dying, writing and crying over their words, so silly and simple and loving. Suddenly looking up, I saw the old vicar moving like fate down the hospital ward until... He stood still beside her where she sat at a bed. Dear friend, come home. I have tragic news, he said. She looked straight at him without a spasm of fear, her face not stern or masked. Is it Percy or John, she asked. Percy. She dropped her eyes. I am needed here. Surely you know I cannot go until every letter is written. The dead must wait on the living, she said. This is my work. I must day, and she did the whole long day. Out of the dark and dearth of happiness on earth, out of a world inured to death and pain, on a fair spring morn to me a son was born, and hope was born, the future lived again. To me a son was born, the lonely, hard, forlorn travail was, as the Bible tells, forgotten. How old, how commonplace to look upon the face of your firstborn and glory in your lot. To look upon his face and understand your place among the unknown dead in churchyards lying. To see the reason why you lived and why you die. Even to find a certain grace in dying. To know the reason why buds blow and blossoms die. Why beauty fades and genius is undone. And how unjustified is any human pride in all creation save this common one. And John came home on leave and all was joy and thankfulness to me because my boy was not a baby only but the heir. Heir to the Devon Acres and a name as old as England. Somehow I became almost an Englishwoman. Almost at one with all they ever did. All they had done. I want him called John after you, or if not that, I'd rather... But the eldest is always called Percy, dear. I don't ask to call him Hiram after my father. But the eldest is always called Percy, dear. But I hate the name Percy. I like Richard or Ronald or Peter like your brother or Ian or Noel or Donald. But the eldest is always called Percy, dear. So the vicar christened him Percy. And Lady Jean gave to the child and me the empty place in her heart. 
poor lady. It was as if she had seen the world destroyed, the extinction of her race, her country, her class, her name, and now she saw them live again. And I would hear her say, No, I admire Americans. My daughter-in-law was an American. Thus she would well repay the debt, and I was grateful. They must come in in the spring. Don't they care sixpence who's right? What a ridiculous thing saying they're too proud to fight. Saying they're too proud to fight. Wilson's pro-German, I'm told. No, it's financial. Oh, quite all they care for is gold. Seem to like writing a note. Yes, as a penman, he's bold. No, it's the Irish vote. What could I do but ache and long that my country, peaceful, rich and strong, should come and do battle for England's sake? What could I do but long and ache? And at last, at last, like the dawn of a calm, fair day after a night of terror and storm, they came. My young, light-hearted countrymen, tall and gay, looking the world over in search of fun and fame, marching through London to the beat of a boastful air, seeing for the first time Piccadilly and Leicester Square. All the bands playing, over there, over there, send the word, send the word to beware. And as the American flag went fluttering by, Englishmen uncovered, and I began to cry. How beautiful upon the mountains, how beautiful upon the downs, how beautiful in the village post office, on the pavements of towns, how beautiful in the huge print of newspapers, beautiful while telegraph wires hum, while telephone bells wildly jingle the news that peace has come. That peace has come at last, that all wars cease. How beautiful upon the mountains are the footsteps of the messengers of peace. In the depth of the night, when the old house was sleeping, I, lying alone in a desolate bed, heard soft on the staircase a slow footstep creeping, the ear of the living, the step of the dead. In the depth of the night, betwixt midnight and morning, a step drawing near on the old oaken floor, on the stair, in the gallery, the ghost that gives warning of death, by that heartbreaking sigh at my door. Bad news is not broken by kind, tactful word. The message is spoken ere the word can be heard. The eye and the bearing, the breast make it clear, and the heart is despairing before the ears hear. I do not remember the words that they said. Killed, do I? November? I knew John was dead. All done and over that day long ago, the white cliffs of Dover, little did I know. Nanny brought up my son as his father before him, austere on questions of manners, habits, and food, generously yielding a mother's right to adore him, thinking that mothers never did sons much good ready to lay down her life for her charge and ready to administer discipline without consulting me, bringing him up much better than I could do it, teaching him to be civil and manly and cool in the face of danger, and then, before I knew it, the time had come for him to go off to school, off to school to be rid of women's teaching, set on the road to manhood at seven years old into a world where a mother's hands vainly reaching will never more clasp and comfort and hold. Rabbits in the park scuttling as we pass, little white tails against the green grass. Next time, Mother, I really must bring my gun. I know you don't like shooting, but John's own son. That blonde, bold face, those clear, steady eyes, hard to be certain that the dead don't rise. Jogging on his pony through the autumn day, bad year for fruit, mother, but good salt hay. Bowling for the village as his father had before, coming home at evening to read the cricket score, back to the old house where they had begun, just as his father and his grandfather had done. 
Later than many, earlier than some, I knew the die was cast, that war must come, that war must come. Night after night, I lay stealing a broken heart to face the day when he, my son, would tread the very same path that his father trod. When the day came, I was not sealed, not ready. Foolish, wild words issued from my lips. My child, my child, why should you die for England too? He smiled. Is she not worth it if I must, he said. John would have answered yes, but John was dead. Is she worth dying for? My love, my one and only love, had died, and now his son asks me, his alien mother, to assay the worth of England to mankind today. I thought of my father's deep traditional wrath against England, the redcoat bully, the ancient foe, that second reaping of hate, that aftermath of a ruler's folly and ignorance long ago. Long, long ago. Yet who can honestly say England is utterly changed? Not I, not I. Arrogance, ignorance, folly are here today. And for these my son must die? I thought of these years, these last dark, terrible years, when the rulers of England bade the English believe lies as the price of peace. Lies and fears, lies that corrupt and fears that sap and deceive. Rulers of England... For them must I send out my only son to die? And then, and then, I thought of the history of Englishmen, of Queen Elizabeth stepping down over the stones of Plymouth Town to greet the men who had sailed away from Rocky Inlet and Wooded Bay, free men, undisciplined, uncontrolled, some of them pirates, all of them bold, feeling their fate was England's fate. Coming to save it a little late, much too late for the easy way, much too late, and yet never quite too late to win in that last worst fight. Men who had governed England know that dreadful line they may not pass. Even Elizabeth, long ago, honored and loved and bold as brass, daring and subtle, arrogant, clever, yet even the great Elizabeth never dared oppose the sullen might of the English standing upon a right. And were they not English, our forefathers? Never more English than when they shook the dust of her sod from their feet forever, angrily seeking a shore where, in his own way, a man might worship his God. Never more English than when they dared be rebels against her. That stern, intractable sense of that which no man can stomach and still be free, writing, when in the course of human events, writing it out so all the world could see whence come the powers of all just government. The tree of liberty grew and changed and spread, but the seed was English. I am American bred. I have seen much to hate here, much to forgive. But in a world where England is finished and dead, I do not wish to live.